Today's show is brought to you by Global X. Since 2008, Global X ETFs has been committed to empowering investors with unexplored and intelligent solutions. Global X specializes in ETFs that track emerging trends like the rise of artificial intelligence as well as strategies aimed to generate high income potential. Visit GlobalXETFs.com to explore a lineup of more than 90 ETFs, along with insights to help you navigate a dynamic investing landscape. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Doing a little research this morning, Michael. Through Friday. Give us a timestamp. What are we recording right now? Because oh, yeah, that's right. It's Monday morning, 1030 Eastern Standard Time. We're recording a day early because uh, production team needed some extra help. And listen, we're, we're willing to work with them. Right? Yeah. This is for you, Duncan. 31 new all-time highs for the S&P 500 through Friday's close. And I was looking at some of the stats today because it just, I, I mean, there's some NVIDIA stuff that you could point to that's uh, it's kind of exciting. But in general, it's bull markets are kind of boring. So we've had one daily gain of 2% or more this year, just one time, 14 days of 1% or more out of like 120 trading days, no 2% down days for the whole year, and just seven days of minus 1% or worse. So it just got me thinking, it, the bear markets are the headlines, right? Like bear markets just beat you over the face and beat you over the head like with constant pain. And this is, look at what's happening. And bull markets are just, for lack of a better word, boring. There's yeah. just not much to a bull. It's, it's, it's like slowly and methodically moves up and there's not a lot of exciting stuff that happens during a bull market. No, it's happening. So interestingly, NVIDIA is down 10% from its highs which is okay. not much when you double and double and double again. But still, it's 10% off its highs and the market is right near it all. The market's not budging. Does this get back to the theory that Bitcoin really is the is like an AI proxy or a risk-on proxy? Because isn't, isn't Bitcoin down double digits as well? NVIDIA is Bitcoin bringing, just tracking Nv NVIDIA? NVIDIA is bringing Bitcoin down? Uh, I don't know if I buy that, but... Okay. Uh, John Reckenthal from Morningstar did this thing where he looked at the last 10 years of returns. And he went back in time to 2014 and looked at what people were saying then about the prospects for returns. Because remember, this is, we'd all, we hit new all-time highs again. The market had already been up a lot since then. Remember, 2013 was kind of the, the switch was flipped. And it was like, okay, we're, we're back on. And then people started getting worried again. So he looked at the, the mainstream estimates of people for what are returns going to be some expert estimates and then pessimist ex estimates, which obviously I think we know who those people probably are. Where did he Where did he grab these? Uh, basically, the research from Wall Street. He said it was it was Bogle and Schiller and and all the people you know probably. Okay. So it was, so he went back and what did people say at the time versus what it actually was, and I, I guess the mainstream estimates would be more like the Wall Street strategists, and that was the highest at eleven percent. The expert estimates was seven and a half percent, and then the pessimist said two and a half percent per year. I have to be honest; I was probably between experts and pessimists. I remember my first my first post on preparing for low returns was probably twenty fifteen. Probably because we were reading a lot of those same articles, <laughs> right? That like look at the dividend discount model or something. But the last, S and P blew last time I listened to Bogle. Thanks a lot, Jay. <laughs> The S&P blew away even the mainstream at the high end of the estimates. What did, wait, what did, what did the S&P 500 do over the 10-year period? Nearly 13% per year. What was the exact number? I'm just 12 curious. 12.7%. What was the exact number on the chart? 12.69%. <laughs> nice. Just had to go out two decimal places, didn't he? Uh, but I, I just think it's worth remembering how every, no one thought this was possible. There was no one saying, we're going to get like 13, 14% returns. I looked the other day, since the start of 2009, the S&P has compounded at 14.5% annually. Damn. Just an, just an amazing run. So I, I had our chart kid, Matt, put this together. I looked at these various cycles of really bad returns, really good returns, and you can see it goes back and forth. These things are cyclical. I did real returns here because the 70s, it makes it look, it actually wasn't as terrible on a, nominal base. It was like 6%, but with inflation, it was negative 1%. So you have these cycles where you basically go nowhere for a decade or so, sometimes more than a decade. And then you have these two to three decade periods sometimes where you have way above average returns. My first instinct is I don't like this chart because if history holds, it means we've got low returns going, going forward. But I will say, look, look how long these periods can last. 1942 to 1965, that's 23 years. 82 to 99, that's 17 years. We're only at 14 years, so 
doesn't mean it has to stop right now. The point of my blog post about this was that in real time, you can never tell how long this is going to go. Because in 1987, I've read all the stories, all the books. People thought we were going into a depression when the stock market crashed. Like, no one would have ever thought we have 12 or 13 more years to go of this bull market at that point. I'm sure everyone thought that this is it. And the same thing in that 42 to 65 period, there was four bear markets. There was like 10 regular everyday 10% crashes or whatever. So that's the whole point of it is trying to predict the end of these secular cycles is nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah, that's all. That's all I'm saying is the, the mean reversion thing. It's not like trees don't grow to the sky. You have above average returns and you have below average returns, but good luck predicting when it's going to happen. Right. That's the point. Just, just wanted to contrast here. I'm talking about the 60-40 portfolio. You and I are kind of a 60-40 today. We're very diversified. I'm very colorful. You are the more black. So we're we're a good contrast today. It's a great looking shirt. Tropical Bros. I have way too many. My wife is. <laughs> con you got another shirt? She's always asking me. We got. An, what do you need? Another pair of shoes? Need another shirt? You know, I got yeah. a text message this morning because I wore my Tropical Bros. Beach to the. I wore my Tropical Bros. shirt to the beach, as I normally do. And I got, a text, I got a text message this morning. Hey, what was it, what was it, the brand of that Hawaiian shirt? <laughs> the gentlemen love them, don't they? Uh, John Authors at, at Bloomberg did this, and he did a global 60-40 portfolio. So this is taking everything into account. Is, and it, the, the headline of this chart is really funny. It says, somehow the classic asset mix has set a new all-time high. Like, like, I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. But this is, almost, this is almost more impressive than the stock bull market just because of how bad bonds were or have yeah. been. So it's a new all-time highs in the 60-40 portfolio because the bond piece was so, so bad and hasn't obviously hasn't made up for the losses yet. Stocks have been pulling their weight, but this was this was surprising to me. Which part? That we hit an all-time high? Yeah, just that because bonds are yeah. still in a pretty deep drawdown depending yeah. on what you're looking at. Yeah. The uh the the bears lose again. As always. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe they win in Europe. One of the, you know one of these one of these days we're gonna one of these one of these sound bites is gonna age extremely poorly. I'm 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 prepared for that. Yeah, I don't know though. The is it though? <laughs> well, eventually no, I, could, no, it could no, be in, it could be in 2036, but yeah, eventually. No, because the thing is, we we are always open to the possibility of bear markets. That's not the thing. Is the the people who constantly predict them every single day or every single year just by sheer logic and averages, they're going to be wrong more than they're right. But if you're someone who says, most of the time the market goes up and sometimes it goes down. Can never be wrong. So that's the, the ultimate grand, true. The, the ultimate Grand Rapids hedge. Most <laughs> of the time true. stock go up, sometimes they go down. It's true. It is true. That's a fact. Isn't it? That's the, those are words to live by as an investor. Maybe unless you're in Europe. Okay, so I got a bunch of charts about Europe. And um, it's funny, people always... People always try to predict the downfall of like the American Empire. Like this is this is Rome 2.0. Uh, why don't they talk about Europe like this? Why don't they say like? <laughs> well, because Europe's not on top. That's why. <laughs> but I, I guess no one ever talks about the fact that the European Empire is crumbling before our eyes or has crumbled. So look at this: the market cap of Nvidia, and we've done this before, is now bigger than UK, Germany, and France. This is Deutsche Bank chart, and it's it's funny how quickly it caught up to those. Uh, I wonder if, if I wonder like uh, a, a good companion chart would be what are the total earnings and uh, revenue of those markets versus Nvidia. I'm sure they dwarf it. I don't know. Is it ten to one, fifteen to one? That's true. Number of employees for all those companies versus the number of employees at Nvidia. Here's another chart from the Economist: GDP and market capitalization as a percentage of the world total for Europe. Since 2000, market cap has gone from eh, one third to a little more than 15%. GDP has gone from nearly 40% to 25%. Not good, as you would say. Not good. Here's another one. Uh, this is from the FT. Productivity in the US versus Eurozone in the UK. Look at how much that productivity has diverged since the great financial crisis. Now, what, were, I'm, I'm, what were some of the explanations in the replies? I, I mean, a lot of people said, well, we can fire workers here and Capital, it wasn't, there wasn't a great example. Is it just capitalism? I, I think so. <laughs> okay, that works. Hand up. I've never really gotten a good uh, explanation of how to calculate productivity. It's like what's left over. It's, like it, yeah, that's, it's a residual. It's a, it's a, it's a filler, right? Yeah. Uh, finally, here's one more. Market capitalization of venture-backed companies valued at over a billion dollars. And it shows China and the US 
China's actually pretty close to the U.S. here, which is surprising. And then Europe is just way, way down at the bottom. Mm. So maybe part of it is, so the, again, the point of like the Roman Empire falling, how, how long did Europe, how long were they kings for? How many years? Hundreds and hundreds of years? Thousands. Did, didn't you watch House of the Dragon? That's true. Since House of the Dragon in the 1300s. What a show. Unbelievable, right? I think it's better than Game of Thrones. At least to, to, to the outset. Game of Thrones, I think people forget. At the very beginning of the show, it was very slow and boring. I think coming out of the gate, the dragon one is better. It's, it's excellent. So here's what Europe does have. Tourism. This is from the Wall Street Journal. They say Europe has a new economic model, basically. And tourism account, they, they, they use Portugal as a, an example here. Tourism generates one-fifth of economic output in Lisbon and supports one in four jobs. Portugal's gross domestic product grew nearly 8% between 2019 and 2024 compared to 1% for Germany. So it's saying all these places in Europe are just packed with American tourists because their dollar takes them stronger. And I don't know, everyone looks on social media for the best places to go now. And it's, it's more or less saying all these, like Greece and Portugal have grown faster and Spain has grown faster than Germany. What's more the last or time less you've because done, of tourism. Well, I've done a trip to Europe since 2015. It's probably going to be another couple of years. You? Mine was a work one. I, I mean, can you imagine taking little kids to Europe? I know some people do it. I, I can't imagine doing that. Doesn't sound fun. No, I, I, the, the time change and the, I don't know. Do you think your kids would really care about seeing all the, castles and churches and ruins and such. No, I know My kids would be over it yeah, very fast. Yeah, yeah. I know people do it. And so anyway, it, it's the article is also saying what happens if the dollar weakens and pe people stop traveling there because of it. But it seems like American tourism spending is kind of propping up the European economy. Without that, that's like the biggest thing they have going for You know, them. you're just taking flamethrowers to all sorts of people. <laughs> now it's people who take their kids to Europe. No, I'm I'm I I'm saying good for them. I couldn't do it personally. Ben's nice, but also mean. <laughs> here's here's my mean of the week. I was just asking the question. Here's my mean of the week. Uh, I got an email. Uh, I had an email exchange with somebody to set up a meeting, and they gave me two dates, but warned me that their calendar fills up very fast. It was like a buy now before it's too late for an email. That, ah. that's, a, that's a turn off now. Yes. Boy, you, your meeting etiquette on emails is, like you should have a list of rules. Well, like I just, how to I just, set up a meeting with Michael Batnick. I just behave uh, like, a, like a proper gentleman. I don't, I don't tell people, sign up now or else. I agree. That's very aggressive. Yeah, come on. I mean. Yes. So, so the, the point is though, what, like, what needs to happen in Europe to, to change this? Uh, is that a, is that a real question? Do you expect me to have an answer to that? I live on, I live on Long Island. I haven't been to Europe in ten years. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what goes out there. All right. Yeah. It, it, they need to pivot I, to capitalism. Is that right. the answer? I, I guess maybe my whole point here is that I'm I'm surprised by all of these figures more than anything. That it's happened this quick since the 2008 crash. Basically, since then we've just gone in two divergent paths. Yeah. Okay, Howard Silverblatt. I think, I think he's at the S&P. Th this, this surprised <laughs> He me. is at the S&P. Okay, he said, Today, NVIDIA became the 12th company to become the largest in the S&P 500 since 1926. More or less companies than you would expect it. Less. Way less for me. Yeah, only 12, so like uh, not even well, he one of, just yeah. barely more than one a decade. Yeah, so it's like one every eight or nine years, I guess. So he lists them, AT&T, Apple, Cisco, DuPont, Exxon, GE, GM, IBM. That was a lot of letters. Microsoft, NVIDIA, Philip Morris, and Walmart. I would have expected there would have been more turnover. When was DuPont at the top? In the it had to be 60s? like 60s or 70s, probably. Yeah, so I, I guess, because we've talked, so do you think that these stocks, when they become the biggest, do they just kind of become the market? No. When, when they... What do you mean? Oh, in terms of returns? No, they underperform. Yeah. No, 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 they underperform dramatically. We, uh, Ned Davies used to have a great chart about this, or was it the Lutol Group? I can't remember. And then, uh, but Mobison did a piece recently that I highlighted showing that like Apple bucked the trend. If you had just invested in the largest stock when it became the largest stock on a go-forward basis, your returns were horrible. Like really yeah, bad. I guess GE. Yeah, really, GE, really, really sense. bad. Uh, and Apple broke, Apple broke this. Microsoft too. 
Yeah. Because they've, ph- they've been phenomenal investments since they became the biggest over the last 10 years. The theme of the show so far, Ben is surprised. I'm surprised that there's not more names that have made it just for a little bit, you know? Yeah. Uh, this was a good tweet from Ben Lang. Uh, if you joined NVIDIA five years ago as a mid-level product manager with an annual $70,000 stock grant over four years, just that initial grant would be worth $10.6 million today. I don't know if these numbers are right, but I, I, I guess back of the envelope would have to be pretty close. How many like how many decamillionaires has Nvidia created? Yeah, probably a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, that's wild. Um, reach out to Ritholtz Wealth Management if you're one of these people. I'm just gonna put it out there. Hey, that's a good plug. But no, <laughs> but, but that just life changing amounts of money in a short period of time for these people. Yeah. What is this headline? Okay, read it. Stock obsessed Gen Z are using astrology and tarot to invest and swearing by the results to the tune of over $400,000. Okay. So can't believe a lot you fell of people, for this. I can't believe you fell for this. So a lot of people, I, I'm looking deeper than the headline here. So they talk about some woman who quit her job as a tarot reader to day trade, and she says she's earning $5,000 a month you ever, day trade. You ever go to a tarot reader? I don't peg you as a tarot reader guy. I think, no. I, would, I, th- I think I would just giggle if I went to see one of those people. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Counterpoint, I, I, they say something that surprises me, and I just immediately melt and start crying. <laughs> that's, true, that's true. How did you know that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's always very generic. And I did and, lose somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a genius. So they talk about driven by the fear of missing out and determination to escape the corporate rat race, over 70% of the generation owns stock according to NASDAQ. That number seems high to me. That might, I don't know if that's a survey or what, but my whole point here, a lot of people will look at this story and say, this is ridiculous. These Gen Z people don't know what they're doing. They're day trading. They're, they think that this is easy. I think this is a good thing that Gen Z is obsessed with the stock market. If that's if that's a real thing, I don't know what the actual numbers of Gen Z people in the stock market are, but it's got to be way more than millennials at their age. I I looked at this. This is how long I've been blogging for. I wrote a piece in 2014 called "Millennials and the New Death of Equities," and it was a UBS survey that talked about how millennials are totally skeptical about long term investing. They don't want anything to do with the stock market. Hmm. And yeah, this is better. So th- this is better, right, than that. In 2014, were you still using your pen name or, or were you out of the closet? Uh, with this, with Wealth Common Sense, I never used a pseudonym. I wish I would have. Oh. Oh, you were always Ben Carlson? That's me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan just slacked. I'm convinced that Mike's email pet peeves are part of a psyop to prevent people from ever emailing him. No, quite the opposite. <laughs> quite the opposite. Pretty- I, you should see my inbox. It's loaded. Loaded. And and 98% of the time, people do the right thing, say the right thing. So I wish I could drop a Seinfeld reference here, but you are not a Seinfeld person, but you are Try the, soup, you're the seen, soup Nazi of yeah. email. Like you have to stand in, it's all these rules to order the soup. That's I'm you the, for I'm, email. I'm really not that particular, but don't, don't buy now me in an email. Come okay. on. Duncan and John, I'm going to need you to superimpose Michael's head on the soup Nazi with the little white getup just for the video, please. I did make it four seasons through Seinfeld. Okay. All right. I, that was one of those shows for me that we every time every night we get home from co- from classes it was on TBS for like four hours after college. So you, Can I give you, a good plug for uh, a plug for a good background show? I'm really into the the golden collectibles things on Netflix. Great background I show. I don't know what that is. It's it's collectibles. It's like it's like Pawn Stars, but more fun. Reality show. Okay. Is, does Pawn Stars still make new episodes? Can't be right. I. I used to be a big reality TV show person. The only one I watch now is Welcome to Wrexham. All, all other reality TV shows for me have kind of gone by the wayside, unfortunately. I was a big dating show person back in the day. So Robin shares a Netflix uh, profile with me. So I've, I'm, 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 hor- I'm a barbell. I've got horror movies and reality TV. That's what the algorithm recommends for me. Okay. For me, it's all just shark movies because my son watches so many. But now he's scared to go in Lake Michigan because of the mm. shark, because of the 10 days under Paris or whatever it's called. There's no sharks there, are there? No, there's no sharks in fresh yeah, water. I have to right. try to explain this to him, but you know, right. he said, how, well, how did the shark make it into Paris though? Ooh, he does have you there. You know? Uh, so this is a funny chart for me from Torsten Slack. Households turned bullish on equities when the Fed started talking about rate cuts. It's a survey of consumer expectations. The average that US stock prices will be higher one year from now. And the average of this is probably eh, 45%. Now it's at 40%. Why are people so bearish? The average is 45%? Yes. This ju- this is just sort of watch what they do, not what they say, I guess. Because we've talked about this. The stock market is up 75% of the time on a one-year basis. 
So if people are saying 40% of the time they think it's going to be higher one year from now, either people are always bearish or they have no idea what they're talking about. One or the other. Yeah. Yeah, 75% of the time it works every time. Friend of the show, Sam Rowe, uh, is always sharing these really good Goldman Sachs nuggets. And uh, this is my one of my favorite charts. Who, holds, who owns the stock market? I want to show me what, tell me what pops out at you from this because I have something I want to see. On, I want to see if we're seeing through the same lens. Okay. It's ownership breakdown by households and ETFs and passive mutual funds and pensions and all these different. All right, so I'm not going to say the obvious one because it used to be it used to be owned entirely by by households more or less, right? It was 90%. yeah, 95 percent was owned by households in 1940s. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so two things jump out at me. Number one, business holdings used to be a much bigger piece of the market. Was that pensions? Oh no, it says there's a place for pensions. Okay, so whoops, never mind. What what? So what is that? Okay, I don't know what that one is. That's okay. a good question. All right, throw that one out. Uh, foreign investors. Okay, foreign investors is big. Here's the one that stood out to me. Passive mutual funds and ETFs make up combined 14% of the market. Oh, that is a good one. That's a tiny percentage for people who think that that's driving a bubble in the stock market. Okay. That's, that's not a very big percentage, right? Mm. It's, big when, it, it's big in terms of the, the fund well, mutual fund well, industry, but- No, no, no. But but if you look at flows, it's everything. True. But active mutual funds are 12%. Passive and ETFs are 14%. Okay, active mutual funds are only 12%. See, there really are no price setters. <laughs> that's, that's the interesting thing. Foreign investors are bigger than, than both of those cohorts. Huh. My whole point is just that the whole passive indexing is leading the bubble. It makes up a very small percentage of the overall stock market. Right. I, again, I counter with it, but it's every dollar of flows. More or less. True. But it's on the margin. That's what I'm saying. All right. Eh, but I'm just saying flows. All right. So so we look at the market every different way we can, right? Earnings and these companies, and we look at it all. This is just, this is what we do. Vanguard had this piece that kind of puts this stuff into context a little bit, into perspective. They, they showed a 4% rule starting in 1973, 1983, 1993. What would happen if you took 4% per year, adjusted for inflation? Where do you end up in 30 years? And starting in 1973, because inflation was so much higher, you're adjusting for that. You're, you didn't do very well. No. 1983, perfect. You did awesome. 1993, you did, you did pretty darn good too. What's with these My, starting points? Oh, uh, oh, they just started every, every 10 years? Okay. Yeah, they were, just, they were just kind of trying to show and I think wanting to use 2023. All right, takeaway is what? What are, we, what, what are you trying to say? For as much analysis and breaking down that we do of the markets, a lot of it is really just driven by luck, unfortunately. And there's sometimes the, the timing component is the most important thing you can do. Yeah. Nick Majuli had an incredible stat uh, that I'm going to butcher, but it was like from, from the call it 1970 or 19, whatever. If you outperform the market by 10% a year, you didn't do as well as somebody who underperformed the market by 5% a year from 1990 to whatever. The 80s and 90s, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, saying the 80s and 90s, just being in that Just time really frame. showing that when you get started, it's, uh, it's everything. I also want to say the no one actually uses the 4% rule. Bloggers do. That's not true. Bloggers do. Don't you think, though, like if, if you're talking actual clients who use the 4%, even if you started as a baseline – People's spending fluctuates so much in retirement. It probably yeah. is very high at the beginning of retirement. It slows down at the end. Yeah. Healthcare costs, one-off costs. I, I'm just pretty sure no one actually uses the four percent rule. I suspect. Like I suspect that you have a spreadsheet with a four percent rule built in. I will not be a four percent rule guy. Five. Gonna, That's thanks to your savings. Maybe, maybe be, push it to six. I'll be a die with zero guy. I'll push it way up. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what my spending rule is going to be. Uh, all right, let's talk about the economy. Money market funds are currently paying $500 billion in interest. That's 2.5% of annual consumer spending. See, I like it when you, he, this is another Torsten Slack one. He puts a denominator in here for yeah. us to put this num numbers in perspective. So I think it, it's, it's great perspective. I'll, I'll pick a nit here in that I still believe that money market income does not influence spending. 
I agree. I'm sure most people are not taking that income and then spending it immediately. Right. Some you think people are like, oh my God, I'm getting an extra $800 a month in my, on my cash. I'm going to spend that. Right. I agree. Here's where people are spending. Concerts. I'm not a huge concert goer. I've mentioned this to you. I think I said it to you the other day, especially as a middle-aged person. I used to go to concerts when I was younger. Uh, I, I'm not ashamed to say I probably went to four or five Dave Matthews Band concerts with my friends. That's okay. But that, that was an excuse to go somewhere and get drunk, right? It wasn't like I was the biggest fan of them and knew all their songs on a set list. So my wife and I went to see Zach Bryan in Detroit at Ford Field this week, last week. And so we're talking, they must have had three quarters of the, of the space open and behind the stage it was closed off, you know? So we're talking, mm-hmm. I don't know, 40, 45,000 people because I think it could hold 60, 65,000 in there. So packed. Here's some, some observations. They have about four of those booths set up where you can buy the, you know, I went to Zach Bryan tour shirt, right? The shirt of the sweatshirt. Did you buy one? No, you don't buy the concert shirt, but just asking. everyone else did. Yeah. Uh, the lines to, to buy the merch were going around the whole stadium, every single line. I couldn't believe how long the lines were to buy this merch, just to prove, listen, I went to the concert, damn it. I got my experience and I'm going to show everyone I did it. No, I, I, I don't remember, this is, maybe this is just me being a hater again on young people, but I don't remember me or any of my friends ever being like, we need to buy the concert t-shirt, right? True. Like, you don't, you don't buy the... Although I did have a friend who, whenever we traveled, he would buy a t-shirt of the city we went to. Well, like, let me ask you a look, question. Are you a, do you, are you a singer? Are you a head nodder? Are you a dancer? None of the above? Do you just sit there? Do you just stand there awkwardly? Like uh, I do? Well, uh, I got a little tuned up for Zach Bryan. I had some, some of the tall Budweiser, so I might have been singing a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, one of the best live shows I've ever been to. I, he was, the guy was, it was amazing. But here's my other thing, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but I assumed that crowd would be eh, 30s, 40s-ish. And it was not that at all. I felt old. It was average age 18 to 22, probably. Young, young, young people. And how much were the tickets? Like, get-in tickets. So this is the thing, what I, this is my question. We got pretty good seats, and now, not great seats, but pretty good seats. And we paid a decent amount of money for them. T- say the number. I'm trying to think with the Just the say fees. the number. Say the number. Don't be embarrassed. We're all friends Probably here. six or seven hundred bucks per wow. ticket. Wow. Wow. And pretty good seats. And all around me is these 18 to 22-year-olds. And I'm thinking, how the hell are these kids affording this? They're trading. Didn't, aren't you paying attention? I Tarot guess so. reading. I'm going, to a, I'm going to a Billy Joel concert, the last concert, actually, a month from tomorrow. July 25th. Yes, I used my ticket broker. Who I highly, highly recommend. The, get, the cheapest tickets on Ticketmaster are $900. Now, it's his, it's his last one, but I've never spent that much money on a, on a concert ticket in my entire life. But you have to go because you're from Long Island. Got to do it. My, my one big East Coast question is always, who's more overrated, Billy Joel or Bruce Springsteen? See? You are such a <laughs> hater. <laughs> That's just how I get people from New York really angry with me. <laughs> So the Wall Street Journal had this piece. You about, also don't like bagels. I'm I'm starting to think that you don't like a certain type of person around here. I'm not going to say, <laughs> I'm not going to get more specific than that. No, my whole point is just bagels are fine. Donuts are better. They're not substitutes though. It donuts complement uh, bagels. It's a it's a carb for breakfast, and they're both round. So it's in a round. Food. So Wall Street Journal had this piece about concert tickets, and they say they've nearly doubled over the past decade. Uh, and the average ticket for the top 100 tours in North America has increased more than 40% over the last five years. And I can attest to this. It's, it's expensive. But they were saying that these people are paying, shelling out for VIP. It's like staying in the, sitting in the box and having these barbecue and tacos and high-end. And like they're saying the, the demand is insatiable for this stuff, to have the VIP access at these I, tours. I did the VIP experience once. Or like not VIP, just a box, a suite at Madison Square Garden for a concert once. Uh, who did I go say? Um, Rage Against the Machine. I don't like Rage Against the Machine. Not that I dislike him, but it's not like I, I wouldn't go otherwise. But if somebody incites me to a suite, I'm going. I don't care who's playing. I don't care if it's uh, Blippi That's on fair. stage. I don't care if it's Blippi. I'm going. Great okay. experience. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I could do Blippi. I've heard enough of him over the years. I've had enough. But the point of this like VIP access, so another one from, the, I can't remember where I stole this one from, but the highest income quintile we talked about this accounts for like 40% of consumer spending. And that cohort has so much money now. Oh, you know, this is a great chart. So we've spoken about this a lot. The reason why I keep saying that, like, I don't think that it's necessarily 
401ks or money market funds driving spending, the second income quintile and the lowest account for 22% of consumer spending. That's not nothing. And they're spending, right. yeah. they're spending most of their income and their income is up a lot. Right. So that's the, and that's yeah, a much okay. bigger driver of, of everything, of, inf- of everything. Uh, here's another one to show that people are still spending. United Airlines, Carl Quintanilla tweeted this, expect July 4th weekend to be the busiest on record. Is that a lot? Busiest on record? Is, all time, is that a lot? Seems like it. It's a lot. You know, I've never been on a United flight that has the, the screens in the behind the seat. That always irks me. I feel like Delta is the one that has that has them the most consistently. United and American rarely have the screens for you behind the seats. I'm surprised you're not a, a Delta card user. What do you mean? Like, why don't you I, always fly Delta? Is it because the Grand Rapids? Well, sometimes they just don't have the yeah. location. Like, we went to Charleston a few weeks ago. Maybe I did do Delta for that. I can't remember what I did. But remember when we were in Charleston and the woman was giving us the tour and she's talking about how just people are flocking there. Yeah. Right? Everyone's flocking to the house. We've heard this. We have people who, for Riddle's Wealth, who work in Nashville. And they tell us that the difference between Nashville now and 10 years ago, it's like a, it, it's like a, just, the city's just doubling in size. Almost. I, I, so, don't, I don't think necessarily people are flying more because flying is so, e- so easy. But I was listening to Kevin Costner do an interview with Howard. Are you going to see American Horizon, by the way? Or Horizon? It's coming out this week. Probably when it's on a streamer, I guess. Okay. I'm not going to it. Yeah, you're, you're going to be one of the few people who goes to it, huh? Yeah, I think I'm going. Um, but he was talking about just uh, the differences between traveling now and traveling in the 1700s. Or he's like, when you say goodbye to somebody, like that was, you know, have a great life. <laughs> right. I'll see you in, never, maybe in the afterlife. And he said, on a flight, I just flew to New York, and uh, you put your seat back. If you're one of those people, I don't. We don't judge. You get you get a cocktail. You watch a movie. Close your eyes. Yeah, it's easy. And you're there. Yeah, and like the 1700s, the hardest part, like crossing a river, was hard. Like you got all your stuff. How do we cross the river? There's no bridges. Yeah. What happens if you got a cold? Yeah. Right. F- him. So, so the the Bloomberg had an article about how in the South they they call it the anti growth fervor grips U.S. South after pandemic boom, and someone says I live in hell. Like all these southern towns, which People decided I can work remotely. It's cheaper coming from California and New York. So they say that in Tennessee and the U.S. South, the region's population has increased by 2.7 million people, the size of Chicago. So they're saying, like, the, these towns are not big enough for, their, their, for all the traffic, and their municipal systems are, like, the, the water systems are under pressure and strained from all the demand. And they say from early 2020 to mid-2023, the Southeast, including Texas, accounted for more than two-thirds of all U.S. job growth, almost double its pre-pandemic share. Wow. Tennessee's economy was the second fastest growing in the U.S. from that time. Uh, they picked out this one county in Tennessee that the number of apartments in the county doubled in the four years through 2022. And it's one of those double-edged swords of, I live in a place with good weather and it's highly desirable, but now other people want to come here and it's ruining the experience for me. And I don't, I don't know how you how you stop that. So Lawrence Hamtel actually did a whole piece on this. He did a like a white paper on the implications of business and population migration. And just look at the look at the businesses moving to the south and leaving the northeast and midwest. That second chart there. Oh, that's a great chart. And the population going to the south. Just it's insane. And, and all the people who live there probably are saying, we don't want this. So both of our regions, the Midwest and the Northeast, are in secular decline. Yeah, that means less traffic, at least for me. But he, they also show like the tax burden. So they, they look at the difference between California and Texas taxes or New York and Florida taxes in 1980 versus now. And look at how much that, that spread in taxes has jumped. Meaning it makes, so the, the people who live in California and New York, it makes so much more sense for them to move to these areas oh, from a tax perspective. Got it, good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, ben, we got an email from a listener and the TLDR is why are we in such a hurry to cut rates? Okay. Let me just read a quote from this email. It feels to me like we're addicted to historically low rates 
much in the same way that patients begin abusing their once legitimate medications. And frankly, I'm not eager to see the Fed feed into that addiction. In my mind, the case to cut rates should be a much higher hurdle than the case to raise rates. I would agree with you there. Given the natural inclination that lower borrowing costs feels better to the quick gratification sides of us that want everything to be cheap. Simply imagining that at some point rates will hypothetically be cut and saying, why not start now, does not meet that bar for me. I think this person's feelings are felt by a lot of people. Not an entirely uncommon view. Eh, I don't know that the hurdle should be higher for lowering rates than raising rates. All right, well, we could debate that. But I guess one, one immediate, like my immediate reaction to this was, if nothing else, and I'm not suggesting that we need to cut from five and a quarter down to two or anything, but let's start to heal a really dysfunctional housing market. That's that's the biggest case for me is, is yeah. housing, is, which is a huge part of the economy. Right. So Michael McDonough tweeted a chart of existing home sales, and he breaks it down by region. And actually, surprisingly, the Midwest is uh, hanging in there. But the point is, if you just look at the total, it's it's bad. It's really bad. People yeah, so are people had, are stuck. You got to unlock some inventory. We had the blip in 2020, 2021, maybe 2022, when people started to build because the demand was there, and now it's falling off a cliff. So Bloomberg had a story saying the new home construction plunges to the slowest pace since June 2020. Wait, and I hold looked on. At, sorry, but before we leave this topic, I just want to say one more thing on, on the why now thing. I am of the opinion and this is mine, you might disagree with me, I am of the opinion that at this point, the job is done, inflation is mostly under control, and the longer you leave rates in a tighter than necessary posture, the more likely you are going to cause a recession. And so to me, the risks just seem asymmetric. I don't necessarily see the harm in taking rates from five to make up a number four and a half, right. whatever it doesn't it is. have to go back to zero. Right. It I don't could, think anybody, I don't, think, anybody's, I don't think anybody's saying that. So that's, that's my, that's where I stand on this. All right, and then back to the, the stuff. Well, I think it ties into this. The stuff in the housing is by them leaving rates higher like this and cutting off. So look at this U S building permits, which had a huge run up in the first couple of years of this decade. And now has crashed again and they're stopping building homes. This is going to make things worse in the future. So the, by the fed, constraining the U.S. housing market, they're just going to make things even that much worse in the future. They're putting it off when just having a little bit of a release valve there to open up some more construction and part of the economy that's 20% of GDP, that makes sense to me as as being a good reason to cut some rates a little bit. Now, I don't know enough about the mechanics of how this works, so I'm talking out of my ass here, but if you told me like, well, well, why doesn't the Fed just start buy mortgage bonds again, and maybe that will help to heal the housing market. If that if that's a legitimate option, and again, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, then then that that's fine too. But there's got to be, the housing market does need some medicine. Right. That, that is one thing. If the Fed would say, listen, we want to leave rates kind of restricted. We're going to cut 25, 50 basis points, but we want to narrow that spread between the 10-year and mortgage rates because we're going to buy some mortgage bonds. That actually kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. Saying like the, the housing piece is the one we want to target. I'm sure people would still freak out about that, but uh, here's a good one from Judge Glock, which sounds like, I don't know, a bad guy in a movie, <laughs> but good name. He says, I don't want to trigger anybody. The OC- OECD housing ranking of total affordability, size, and quality metrics has U.S. at number one. So again, I, I don't know how much the quality piece fits in there, but affordability, size, and quality, the United States is ranked first in terms of affordability across yeah. the globe. I just don't think this makes anybody feel better. Nobody gives a shit about what it's like in uh, what house prices are like in Canada or France. Like I, I don't, I don't live there. I live here, right. and I can't right. buy a house. So. so the guy, so just because the person in France has no AC and a smaller unit than me, uh, and it was built on like sixteen hundred, I don't care. I can't buy a house. Don't care. Okay. Um, I think it works right. though. That's that's my my thought. Here's an interesting survey. Um, this is from Goldman Sachs. Uh, it's the GSAM Global Insurance Survey. Uh, they receive responses from 296 chief investment officers and senior investment professionals, 42 CFOs and senior finance managers, and 21 individuals who serve as both CIO and CFO. The insurance company surveyed have over $13 trillion in balance sheet assets. So these are real people. Real people. And they were polled 
which asset classes do you expect to have the highest total return in the next 12 months? And it's U.S. equities, investment grade debt, cash, et cetera. The whole, the whole shebang bang. 53% said private credit. Even more than stocks. 53%. And here's an, here's an interesting quote that I don't know exactly how to square this circle, Ben. Uh, insurers' appetite for credit is growing. 35% of insurers look to increase credit risk in their portfolios over the next 12 months, despite 59% of insurers expressing concern that the credit cycle is entering a later stage. So we think a recession might be coming, but we're still looking to increase exposure there. So to me, this is very, very simple. This is uh, career risk and incentives, and it's the volatility laundering that Cliff always talks about. Uh, if we don't see the marks, yeah, and look we're at the yield off. we're getting, yeah. right? Yeah. Is it, do you think the, the thought process, too, for a lot of people is, well, it's, it's whatever, 12 or 14% yields. And even if some of these default, we're still going to get 10 or 12% yeah. instead of 12 to 14. Is, you think that's the thinking? I think, I think it's that. I don't think they would say this out loud, but I think not, having, not seeing the volatility, not seeing the prices on a daily basis, like, even though we know that's not real alpha, it feels like it. So? Yes. The, the need or desire for liquidity is trumped by the fact that we don't see the marks every day. Now, global insurers, like, they do have a long-term time horizon. So if any, if it makes sense for anyone to be using these instruments, maybe it's them. Right. But will these people be complaining if and when they can't get their money out on a fast enough basis when they want to? I mean, I would hope not. Yeah. But there's going to be stories in the years ahead if this stuff ever runs into trouble. Uh, listen, they tried to get their money out and they couldn't. Yeah, That's well, coming someday. There was a headline over the weekend that I didn't get to read yet. Pensions piled into private equity. Now they can't get out. Again, I don't of know if the they, reality matches can. the headline, but yeah. um, well, such as, an, yeah, that's what private, uh, that's what private means. Okay. Um, here's a great survey. A couple of surveys that I'm, again, I'm, I'm just not sure how to square all of these, all of these round objects. Per the latest JP Morgan, Blake Miller tweeted this, JP Morgan Institutional Weekly Survey, there's virtually no risk appetite to deploy fresh capital into equities. Investors continue to show no love for stocks in 2024. So they ask, are you, plan are you more likely to increase or decrease equity exposure over the coming days and weeks? And this has plummeted to 17%. And then simultaneously, now these are institutional investors. They've got Bank of America Global Research. There's this global fund manager survey, again, institutional investors, global fund manager survey sentiment, most bullish since November 21. Ben, make it make sense. <laughs> I think we have too many opinions out there today. Let me give you one more. Let me give you one more. Now, these are not necessarily institutional investors only, but Dachun has tweeted, VOO is a virtual lock to blow away the all-time annual flow record. At forty-four and a half billion dollars, it is only five billion away, and it's not even half time. This is su surprising to me that SPY is going to be dethroned potentially because that—that's they had so a large, they had a big head start, huge head start, very big brand recognition. Like you never hear—I don't know—you don't hear people talk about VOO very much, but it's obviously just the the expense ratio. What's SPY expense ratio? It used to be nine. Is it is it lower than that? VOO is three basis points. SPY is, did they, what is it? I'm looking. Okay, SPY is, yeah, nine. SPY is nine, VOO is three. It, which is funny because it, that feels like splitting hairs a little bit, but if you're saying, listen, this thing is three times as expensive as this one. Yeah. We're going to the cheaper one. Yeah. That's surprising though. All right. Uh, Jeremy Horpital, this is, I, I want to hear your explanation of this because I, I can't come up with one. I, I'm asking questions today. Americans spend on average 6.7% of their income on groceries, the lowest in the world. Now, he compared all, this is from our world of data, compared all these different countries. And then my first thought was, oh, well, that's simple because we spend more on restaurants and going out. And then he did a follow-up saying he included restaurant spending as a percentage of income, and it's still the lowest in the world. So is this just because we have higher incomes? What, what would be the explanation for this? I couldn't come up with a good one. Why would we spend the lowest percentage on food in the, in the world compared to all these other countries that spend way more of their income as a percentage on food? Do you think it's just 
we have lower costs here because of uh, bigger, more resources, lower energy cost, like lower taxes. What would the I'm gonna guess it's denominator? Be? I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna guess you're right with the denominator thing. It's got to be we have higher incomes. That'd be my only explanation. But again, I color me surprised on this one. Yeah, color me as well. All right. Uh oh, does the next one show the same thing? Yeah, just with restaurants. So the first one is just groceries, and the second one is groceries plus plus restaurant spending. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good one. Um, Ben, we got an email. I'd like to remind Ben that car horns were invented to warn others of a vehicle's presence or to call attention to a hazard, not to show disapproval. I don't remember. What did you say about honking? Are you, are you a frequent? I said it's are you okay a frequent, give, You're a big okay, horn let guy? Me, let me throw an example out at you. This happens all the time. You're waiting in like a left turn lane and it's a longer light and you know the person ahead of you has got their head straight down looking at their phone. Yeah. Light turns green. Way to beat. Yep. Way to beat. Yep. Honk. Go, a-hole. What are you, you're on your Whoa. phone like an idiot. What sort of, what sort of honk do you give? You probably give a little toot, right? Let's Light be tap. honest. Yeah, you give a toot. Like, if you're, if you're doing that and you're holding up a whole line of cars, you deserve to get a little honk to, hey, wake up, buddy. Get yeah. off your phone. But there, agree, there's a world of difference between a respectful toot and an aggressive honk. Oh, yeah, I don't do it. I don't, I don't hold it. I yeah. give an int. So yeah. I got, I got an aggressive honk uh, yesterday, actually. Uh-oh. Um, and so how I was, it depends. Now, listen, I guess the thing is that you don't know how long you're waiting for, right? If you, if you're staring at the light and it turns green and you get a hunk immediately, that's, that's the worst. So I was looking down guilty as charged. I don't know how long I was looking down for. Oh, so you were the guy I'm talking about. I deserve to be hunked. I did. I, I did deserve it, but it was, it was a too long hunk. And when somebody too long hunks me, I don't move. I, I will <laughs> roll away at five miles an hour. So you had a standoff. Yeah, I've, yeah. So, um, but then the person, so so I'm driving slow, and the person is way far behind me. So eventually, I drive, and they and they're driving, and it was a half a car. You know those half a cars? I got honked at. Uh, yeah. I got aggressively honked at by half a car, and then they were like a mile behind me. That that really annoys me. If so, if you if you're gonna honk, at least go at least speed around me. If you're in that, I don't mind. Hurry. Just a just a little tap. There, yeah, there's probably yeah. two buttons, like one nice, one aggressive. You know how on the toilets in certain states or countries they have. The flush for one, flush for two. That's a great idea. There should be a tap honk and a honk honk. Yeah. I don't use it much, but just when someone needs a little reminder, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Um, Matt Bellany tweeted, Horizon American, an American saga, chapter one, has dropped to a $10 million opening weekend. Not great. That's uh, that's pretty bad, no? So how much money is he going to lose, Costner? He said, they said he put 30 into it. So I don't know the economics of, you know, you margins. He, I, I mean, I'm sure he'd love this to be a a resounding success. I don't know. The guy said he got to do what he wanted. I'm sure it was a fun experience. Why doesn't he just sell to a streamer? If Netflix bought this thing, way more people would see it than we'll yeah. see it at the theater. I'm sure he's probably a theater guy, though. Yeah, no, he, yeah, definitely. He seems like, a, like I, this has to be seen at the theater. You know what kind of bombed over the weekend? Uh, the bike riders. You'll see that when it comes out. Awesome book, Larry Tom Hardy. Yeah, it does I'm a big good. Tom Party fan. Uh, yeah, 10 million bucks. That's not good. Right? It's pretty bad. No, not great. Uh, I just think it's really hard to get people to go to the theater. But Inside Out is just blowing blowing up. So I think Inside I Out think- has done 750 worldwide. 724. Yeah, it's incredible. Wow. I haven't seen it yet. Have you? No. The, I don't my, think I saw the we're, first one. We're waiting for a rainy day to bring yeah. the kids. Logan keeps asking me. Um, all right, I, watched, uh, I watched Monkey Man. It's on Peacock. Dev Patel, who does... Great work. Big fan. Okay. Looks like an action movie. Yeah. It's like a light John Wick. There was, I'd say, I don't know. It was okay. It was, uh, there was parts of it that were really cool that I really liked. And there was parts that just like dragged and weren't overall great. It was, uh, I probably wouldn't recommend it. It was fine. Some good, some bad. Mixed bag. Is that, are we talking an R movie here? Or is it a little lighter fare for my son? Because he likes the action flicks. No, no, no. No, it was violent. It was violent. Okay. Good to know. Uh, I don't have much, but I rewatched, it was on Amazon, came up for like, you might like this, A Guide to Recognizing Your Saints. It's Never a movie that it. came out in the mid-2000s. And it's interesting to look back now. It's a, it's a biopic of this guy who grew up in Queens in the 1980s. But, and it, it does one of those flashback ones, you know, where it's like, here's the guy older and here's him younger with his friends. Holy shit, what a cast. Look at the cast. So Robert Downey Jr., before he took back off again, a young Shia LaBeouf, 
a young Channing Tatum. This is all them, like a young Rosario Dawson before they really took off. Chaz Palminteri is in it. Diane West. Pretty good movie. Eric Roberts. Yeah. Who directed like a, this? I don't know a, who this is. The guy who, the guy who directed it is the guy who wrote it. It's, it's a, it's about his life. It's a, it's based on a true story. So not a great movie, but a pretty Why one did of those you watch good this? flashback movies. I had nothing to watch and it came up as a recommendation for me in the Amazon algo. Okay. They know I like coming of age movies. Yeah. I right. want to re- I want to rewatch uh, as I was listening to Kevin Costner. I haven't seen The Bodyguard since it came out, and, and I I was seven. I, I saw it in 1992. Probably a little good bit movie. too young to watch that. Okay, one of my mom's favorites. That's a good movie. The only other recommendation I got since I've been I haven't been consuming a lot of entertainment lately. Uh, I was thinking this. So Tata said Normal Returns does all the daily links mm-hmm. and just. Does it every single day. But then on Sundays, he puts out the top clicks of the week. And so sometimes if I miss some of his link fest during the day, he does the top 10 most clicked on. And I, I look at that every single week on Sunday to find the stuff that I missed. Uh, so subscribe to Normal Returns. Still the best in the business at putting stuff together that you need to read. Agreed. Animal Spirits at the compoundnews.com. If you're looking at the end of my calendar, do not rush me. Do I'm gonna not need buy the, me. I'm going to need the, the, the list of Michael Batnick email etiquette for how to get on your calendar. I'm a simple man. Just do the right thing. Uh, Okay. Have a great week. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.